This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. This talk is with Sonia Masai, Professor of Shakespeare and Early Modern Studies at King's College, London. Sonia has served as Vice Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at King's College and was recently appointed an Order of Merit Officer of the Italian Republic. This talk will focus on her many contributions to Shakespeare scholarship and to the theater arts. If you are watching us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. If you are joining us via a podcast and wish to watch this program, we are available on YouTube under the search term, Speaking of Shakespeare. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Sonia, it is so good to see you, to get you on the program. Pleasure. Uh, I have a lot of questions for you. I have enough questions for you to last for hours and hours that you don't have, because I'm looking here at your uh, record and the, the enormous amount of work that you've done. And uh, I just, <laughs> I'm gonna try to prioritize things that are, that are recent. And so uh, uh, what, I, what I want to do is to, uh, is to start with your latest book. But first I wanna kind of give an overview of your work you present uh, I just spoke with uh, uh, Shoichiro Kawai, uh, Professor Shoichiro Kawai of the University of Tokyo, and he talks about his work being lined up in a trinity, and you seem to have a trinity here also in Shakespeare and early modern drama, editing, and book history, and also in theater studies, and you work these three angles, and your most recent book is fascinating. I managed to get to read some of it. Uh, it's about accents in Shakespeare. And just if you could lead with that. Yes, absolutely. Um, th thank you for, first of all, for having me on this series. And um, yes, by all means, Shakespeare's accents. Um, I, I don't know if anybody has ever wondered why Shakespeare tends to sound so posh. English is not my first language, um, so I've always been especially sensitive, I think, to how English sounds. And it struck me as peculiar that no one I ever come across spoke uh, in that kind of clipped and crisp accent that you hear on kind of traditional English speaking stages. And so I wondered um, where that voice, that very specific, peculiar Shakespeare voice, um, was, was coming from historically and, and socially and culturally. And um, so I started researching this topic um, also with a very personal uh, investment in the topic because uh, English is not my first language. And so I've always been uh, very aware of the fact that I speak English with an accent. My first language is Italian. And um, in fact, I started uh, learning English when I was quite old. I was already a teenager and I learned English discontinuously. Um, then I picked it up again at university. And by the time I moved to the UK to do my postgraduate studies, I could write an essay in English, but I struggled even to get understood on the bus, you know, at a time when we still used to pay for fares on board, on, on boarding a bus. And I, I got stared at and I got I repeatedly asked you know, what my destination was. Um, so, so for me, um, the, um, the clarity of uh, pronunciation, the connotations carried by accents have always had a very personal um, significance. Uh, and so I started this project with a lot of interest, uh, professional interest, but also personal investment. And I uh, made so many discoveries along the way. And I hope that the, the readers of the book um, uh, may not be aware uh, or may not have been aware either of all those um, times in history, in the history of the perception of Shakespeare in the theater when accent really mattered. Um, so the accent in which Shakespeare was spoken on stage um, um, at key times during the history of the perception uh, caused quite literally outrage. Um, and the outrage in turn 
led to change both in the theater and the arts um, uh, world, uh, but also in society um, at large. So I'll, um, I can give you maybe um, um, a couple of examples. Um, I was uh, especially surprised to find that uh, contrary to um, still dominant wisdom about what Shakespeare and his actors might have sounded like, um, I found that they didn't sound as gutsy and popular and therefore kind of accessible as um, some scholars suggest, uh, but that in fact, they were reprimanded for trying to sound better than they were. Mm -hmm. So for using an accent that at the time was used as usual speech, which would be the equivalent of today's received pronunciation. So the accent spoken by the educated elite. elite. And so they were reprimanded for not only looking other than they were, so for wearing um, uh, 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 luxurious costumes and props that suggested that they were kings and queens and therefore lying about their status, but also for sounding better than they were. Mm -hmm. And that, that uh, was, was uh, uh, it came across as a, um, for me as a genuine kind of discovery and, and surprise. And um, the same applies to later periods. Um, I was really intrigued and amused to find out that one of the most famous Shakespearean actors of all times, um, David Garrick, um, was um, uh, haunted all his life by critics who um, um, noticed and uh, frowned upon his Midlands accent. So one of the great stars, one of the great actors of all times, um, to some, sounded indecorous and inappropriate. Um, but at the same time, the fact that Garrick was um, not classically trained, he didn't sound like a classically trained actor, sparked an incredible na nationwide movement um, that was patronizingly described as um, spouting, <laughs> which describes a kind of an uncouth way of delivering uh, Shakespeare's lines across the country of um, amateur actors who reclaim the right to speak Shakespeare in public. Because uh, post-1660, from the restoration of the English monarchy and the reopening of the theatres onwards, up until the theatre reform of the 19th century, only licensed companies, and there were very few, and, and most of them in central London, were allowed to speak Shakespeare. And they did so in a very kind of uh, uh, controlled, um, accent in a kind of very uh, conventional voice. So th that book has been a labor of love, um, has uh, led me to uh, uh, making um, what were for me genuine discoveries. And I hope that the enthusiasm comes, comes across for, for readers who may also not be as familiar with the history of the sound of Shakespeare on stage. Well, I think you had uh, not stumbled upon, you are in an area that is of uh, eternal intrigue through cultures. Uh, I'm in Japan, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Of course, in Italy, uh, I'm certain that you can tell if someone is from Genoa or from Rome. Uh, it, it's probably ab abundantly clear. I, yeah. grew up, I grew up in the American South and had to uh, struggle a bit in academe because the American Southern accent sometimes is uh, associated with uh, um, bad things, including not being very smart. And uh, mm -hmm. maybe they're right about that, but, uh, uh, but I found that I just naturally changed. And you may have gone through that in, even in your native tongue in, in Italy, you know, once entering in the university, that sort of thing. We've all had to go through uh, this... Uh, this accent thing. Now you point out, and I'm trying desperately now to remember the name of the sort of original person who started OP. I'm very familiar with David Crystal's work. Uh, ben Crystal, his son, is a friend of the program and a uh, good friend of me, uh, of mine. And so uh, we'll talk about them in a second, but who was it you pointed in your introduction to uh, an, an, um, an article or a, an effort by uh, someone in the 30s, 1930s, who began the o OP or original pronunciation. Oh, that, thank business. you, Tom, yes. for, for uh, noticing that. Uh, that was another uh, uh, epiphany. 
um, I came across this woman called uh, Mary Hope Allen, and she was a yes. pioneer. Mary Hope, and, how could I forget? Mary uh -huh. Hope Allen, what, what a great, great name. Yeah. She was a wonderful, uh, very creative, super smart producer, one of the best uh, women producers for, for the BBC. Uh, well, radio was a new medium, so it offered new opportunities for women who could not get uh, jobs in more kind of established institutional um, uh, sectors um, in, in the um, arts world uh, or media and communication. And um, she um, used um, original pronunciation uh, not as an exercise of acoustic archaeology. So she wasn't interested in establishing how Shakespeare originally sounded but she used OP um, to um, diversify that received pronunciation accent that was used on stage to reach out to a more diverse audience, the kind of wider audiences that radio was reaching at that time. Mm. And you can tell from the way in which the programs are presented in the Radio Times, but also from um, existing recordings in the archives of the BBC, that the, the tone was playful. Mm -hmm. um, and the approach was, imagine if you were back in Elizabethan London and you go back home after a hard, way, a hard day's work and you, you know, kick off your boots and uh, um, sit back and enjoy your um, um, uh, AO and switch on the radio. What would you hear on the radio? And, and so there were bits of um, late 16th century news. Uh, and kind of news reports and um, extracts of the plays. Um, Twelfth Night was, was very popular. Um, uh, they, they broadcast um, extracts from Twelfth Night twice um, and uh, in, in OP. Um, and and the, um, the way in which these programs were presented stressed the fact that that was our best guess. Um, that they were interested not so much in uh, authenticity as in just playing around with voices and sounds. And apparently this program was so popular that were adapted for children and broadcast again um, subsequently uh, for a younger audience. Um, and I am so grateful to Julia Mannheim. Um, there's a shout out for Julia, um, mm -hmm. Mary's niece who donated Mary's papers to the University um, of Cambridge um, Library. Yeah. Um, and I was able to access um, some of Mary's papers through, um, because Julia um, had the good sense of depositing all her correspondence and um, notebooks um, at the University Library in Cambridge. Yes. And Julia also has shared with me uh, quite a few uh, personal anecdotes and memories of Mary. And I think uh, Mary is one of those actually women producer that the BBC should make more of. Um, I started approaching um, a BBC um, producer um, and then the pandemic happened. So everything kind of came to a standstill, but it's still um, um, a kind of pet project of mine, um, an offshoot from the book, if you like, that I would like to pursue um, because Mary deserves to be better known um, a legacy is so important because you could say that the whole book is about um, foregrounding diverse voices. So my, my work um, is, is inevitably um, attuned to um, larger changes in the academy, but beyond the academy as well. I, I'm interested in, in diversity. Um, I want to unearth histories of, of diversity. Mm -hmm. And while other colleagues have done amazing work in, uh, for example, early modern critical race studies, um, um, religion, um, um, ethnicity, uh, all, all those um, um, aspects of our um, being human that makes us um, that makes us different. I'm interested in acoustic diversity and, and mm. I think um, it really deserves attention. And it has started to attract attention of um, some really smart creative theater directors. So now Shakespeare sounds, sounds more diverse than it used to 10 or 15 years ago. And you oh, find oh, yes. more now are curating voices did you get to see any of the productions they put on a few years back now? Uh, they did uh, Romeo and Juliet at the Globe, I believe. And I think uh, the Crystals were sort of involved with that. 
Uh, were you able to see that production or any of those? And it was so interesting, again, in the spirit of Mary's work. How, how so was it in terms of to your ear? Was it uh, recognizable or did you, you know? Yes, yes. I think okay. there is this, this preconception that um, OP is impenetrable. And it, it's not. It takes a little bit to tune in. Um, but it just it takes uh, just as long to tune in to Shakespeare performed in RP. Um, and so after a few minutes, you get used to the, the, the slightly different accent and you, you just start to relax and, and you enjoy the fact that uh, this is a different Shakespeare. Um, um, that doesn't sound like a modern day regional Shakespeare. Right. It's, it's, uh, I think it's important to recognize it's an experiment and we don't know what a Shakespeare actually sounded as it does today in OP. I, I'm pretty sure that if Shakespeare was able to listen in, <laughs> he probably wouldn't <laughs> immediately recognize it um, yeah. himself as, yeah. as entirely familiar, you know, because there's a margin of guess, guesswork. Um, but yeah. it's, it's really interesting because... Um, by experimenting with accent and voices, um, you get to hear different things, yeah. uh, different rhyming patterns, different meanings are activated by um, the way in which you pronounce keywords. And so yeah. it's, it's, but just basically really enjoyable. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting um, line of um, research among um, psychologists, um, but also historical linguists that has proved, I think, quite um, uh, quite definitely that there is nothing inherently obscure about regional accents compared mm -hmm. to, uh, or, or foreign accents compared to standard mm -hmm. accents. Yes. It's just familiarity. And, and so, um, because it, it, it just takes a bit to tune in, as I was saying before, you tend to, um, think that the maybe original accent is uncouth and therefore obscure yes it's just a little different um, yes and and fair enough i mean some accents if you're not familiar with them yeah. are <laughs> yeah penetrable so we're not talking about pure a pure regional accent that verges onto a different dialect we're talking about english spoken in accents that um, are, are still kind of uh, recognizable, uh, just unfamiliar. Yeah, well, that really takes us into the theater, doesn't it? And, uh, and also the theater and beyond, I, I want to seize upon one key word there, acoustic key term, acoustic diversity. And mm -hmm. I am uh, extraordinarily interested in the soundscapes of early modern London, uh, and particularly at St. Paul's Cathedral, that sort of thing. I followed that very closely. And also the theater, of course, and that's been written on quite a lot and, and very excellently by uh, several scholars. Uh, but uh, you're, you're digging in a little bit further here with accents that pretty quickly, uh, uh, and I probably shouldn't bring up a, a recent movie, but uh, there, Spike Lee has done a recent m movie uh, entitled uh, Black Klansman, and it uh, stars Denzel Washington. What a fabulous actor, right? His son, uh, and his son speaks and ba basically throughout the movie in a white accent, right? No, and he, can say, he says, I can do jive and I can do white in the movie. I'm quoting the movie. And it's a, a, a true story, but yeah. he, he taught the, this person who became a police officer in Colorado, taught himself how to speak white and actually yeah. fooled uh, the Klan over the phone into thinking that he was a white <laughs> racist, right? It was a brilliant movie. I don't want to do a spoiler alert. It's a couple of years yeah. old, but uh, anything now that is a couple of years old is really only a year old because we sort of missed a year in there, haven't we? But uh, well, it's very readable. I wanted to, uh, this is very readable. Uh, and everything that you do is very readable, but there's uh, a lot of your work that belongs to the scholarship that basically you have to be fairly well briefed on what is going on in the year 1604 or the year 1756, you know, if you mentioned Garrick, 
you have to keep, you know, uh, 18th century and, you know, bring in, I can do that because that's, that's what I can do. Right. I am, um, I'm no good at fishing for trout or fly fishing. I, I haven't practiced that, but I have uh, looked into the other things. So uh, this is a very readable book and it's one you can pick off the shelf and it's uh, very interesting. The amount that I've been able to uh, get on preview yes. because we're, we're still a supply chain is still a little bit slow in getting books over here. Uh, your work, you've done such an enormous amount of work. I feel that we have to get to, uh, we have to move from accents that I could spend the rest of it. I mean, really just for hours, you know, talking about, um, uh, wartime, wartime Shakespeare, you're on a grant and wartime. Now I, you know, if I'm thinking of Sonia, uh, Son Sonia Masai, I'm not thinking that she's going to run toward war as a yeah. topic, right? And what, uh, what is this about? What can we expect from wartime Shakespeare? It's, it's part and parcel of my interest in the afterlife of, of Shakespeare. So uses of Shakespeare over, over time. And um, this is also a collaborative project. Um, my uh, postdoctoral um, research assistant, Amy Litster, she's very much in the driving seat with me. And we found that we shared an interest um, in um, uh, the history plays, uh, and it's a history plays that often get revived at times of war. And so we came upon this kind of idea that intersects with my interest in the reception of, of Shakespeare in performance. Hmm. And so we put an application in with colleagues from war studies um, at King's College London, and I guess the um, the funding body, um, uh, the Liverhume, um, liked also the um, the idea that we're collaborating across um, academic uh, disciplines, mm. and so the work we're doing um, has allowed us to um, uh, nuance and, and change a bit the narrative um, of common sense of uh, among scholars of how Shakespeare was mobilized at times of war, and I'm particularly um, excited by the fact that. Um, Amy is, is, is writing a new monograph, so mostly aimed at fellow scholars, um, but we're also co-editing an exhibition book and co-curating an exhibition that um, um, are going to launch and open simultaneously in autumn 2023. And the exhibition is going to be hosted by the National Army Museum in London, but it's also going to have a digital presence. And so we're going to reach um, a wider audience than, than um, uh, other fellow scholars. And I find that really exciting because uh, people interested in um, war studies and people interested in Shakespeare don't usually meet. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, they don't. Uh, and yeah. they, sh they should. They should. And they should because actually there's, yeah. there's so many overlaps. Um, we found actually that people with a vested interest in war studies or even um, um, high-ranking army um, um, generals and um, colonels um, who are now um, collaborating um, have themselves used Shakespeare or turned to Shakespeare either to inform opinion about um, any kind of given conflict um, or a reading of any given uh, conflict, uh, kind of historically, so retrospectively from the present, looking back at the past. So the this project is quite unusual. Uh, you very perceptibly picked up on the fact that it's, it is like unusual for Sonia Masai to... <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> is It is a little, uh, but I, I understand now it fits, uh, and I wasn't quite sure exactly how it fit, but could I say something like, well, let's take something very... Um, uh, 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 more recent in our minds, let's say World War II, right? Yeah. Would you say, look yeah. at certain productions that came yeah. uh, came up during that time, of course, Henry V, but uh, uh, how maybe Coriolanus, uh, you know, can you do this? Uh, uh, someone who defects and goes to the other side, and then, you know, the back and forth, whatever. Uh, yeah. is, is that appropriate or, or whatnot? And you can see in your reception a sort of stock market of uh, certain plays that are selected during times of, uh, of global yeah. war, particularly world wars. Yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, 
the um, what Amy and I have found um, is that there was a, quite a dramatic shift in, in the use of Shakespeare across time. So we start from the um, Seven Years' War in the middle of the 18th century, mm -hmm. through the American War of Independence, Napoleonic Wars, Crimean Wars, 19th century, and then the two world wars, uh, all the way up to the Iraq War in present day. Mm -hmm. And each, each stage has a different story to tell. And what was interesting to find is that, yes, there are the usual suspects, Coriolanus, Henry V, um, but um, used in very nuanced ways. And um, one of the big surprises to go back to the kind of serendipity of, of uh, kind of research and what you uh, didn't expect you would find is that um, even though each period has a distinctive way of using Shakespeare. So in the 18th century and 19th century, you could say that Shakespeare was uh, mobilized to engage in a battle of wits that was fought um, above and alongside, you know, the kind of military conflict. So both sides of the, the conflict use Shakespeare to satirize and lampoon the, the other side. Uh -huh. Then in the, in the 20th century with the World Wars, to go back to your question, um, Shakespeare becomes a kind of more kind of patriotic. So he's, he's mobilized to, um, uh, to, to rally uh, not just the soldiers, but the, the kind of civilians who are kind of also fighting the war back home, as it were, or supporting mm -hmm. the war effort. Um, but um, never in with a single voice. Um, so uh, what we found is that um, Shakespeare Time of Wars is never used simplistically either um, to support the war or to critique the war. Um, there is a complexity that um, uh, heightens the sensitivity to all the big questions raised by uh, conflict. Um, and more um, recently, um, we found that um, Shakespeare has been used both by theater directors, but also by um, the people who were active in service um, within the British Army to question why uh, a country goes to war. Yes. And so there is a, a kind of resurgence in what is generally described as the just war tradition. Yes. Um, we, we have a, one of, one of our, our contributors is Tim Collins, who um, uh, gave a speech that um, echoed um, um, very closely um, um, one of one of every the fifth um, um, monologues um, as he kind of rallied his his men um, on the eve of the invasion of Iraq, and um, Tim writes uh, beautifully about how he used Shakespeare to make sure that his men um, knew what was about to happen and that yeah. they cohered as a as a band of brothers. Yeah, um, yeah. But Tim Collins doesn't wax lyrical about the, the, the aftermath of that mm. conflict. And in fact, it's public knowledge that then he, he wrote quite critically about, about it um, and then um, uh, resigned um, from, from service, um, having still um, a huge kind of um, sense of duty and, and, and service. Um, so this is, is not his confidence in the uh, purpose of, of the army itself, but in, in kind of the, the reasons for going to war in relation yeah. to that particular conflict. Yeah. And so the complexity, this is the kind of complexity I was telling you about that is not just on the part of scholars who are always looking out for complexity, is even someone uh, like Tim who needed to actually Shakespeare not to nuance, but to bolster the, the kind of sense of uh, brotherhood among his, his men, um, some of whom um, he, he writes very uh, emotionally about it um, yeah. and never left home. Um, some of whom had never encountered death, not even in the family because they, they were kind of still so young. Yeah. And so he, as a, as a leader of other men, wondered you know, how to um, make sure that they cohered um, to, to face um, huge risk for themselves personally and really big questions uh, for which there were no, no, no certain answers even, even then. There was a lot of uncertainty even when the war started. And so the, um, his, his sense of what Shakespeare is useful for is fascinating. As a, yeah. as a Shakespeare scholar, I would never have guessed. 
um, so the rhetorical power of the language to to lift and and guide the the kind of the lift the spirits and guide and and kind of lift the morale, um, but not without nuance, not without complexity. Um, okay. So, so these, these are these, these are, are commanders uh, using Shakespeare with their troops, uh, yes. as, in, in a type of training as part of their uh, maybe emotional, uh, the psychic training, getting young men ready to face battle, basically. That's right. Right. That's right. Oh, well, that's right there. That's uh, that's in the ranks. Uh, I was thinking mm -hmm. more of what might have been played in London, you know, uh, during the Napoleonic period or any period. But you're looking at uh, within the ranks. It's so interesting. Uh, it brings up to my mind, uh, and I may be wrong about this. It's been kind of years. Uh, it's a trouble with <laughs> speaking to experts. But Troilus and Cressida, it's a rhetorical speech where he gives every reason for not going to war with the Greeks. Right. The conclusion should obviously should be let's don't let's don't bother with this. Right. Which they have. They have the walls. They don't have to. Yeah. And then right That's after it. that, they go, let's go. <laughs> you know, you just made the, you know, we, we have we have a wonderful contributor writing about Atrolis and Cressida that was staged in London 1938 as as the country was preparing for another world war. Yeah. And Atrolis and Cressida is a is a you could say is. Shakespeare is never a manifesto, but you could say it's a manifesto for questioning reason for going to war yeah. is, is the most cynical and realistic, I guess, um, assessment of why people go to war. Yeah, maybe and, not nihilistic too. Uh, totally, uh, because nothing survives Troilus and Cressida, both love and war, yeah. kind of two big ideals, you know, honor and love, they get taken to pieces. Yeah. And and uh, and so, um, yeah, Troilus and Cressida, we didn't mention it earlier, but it's another play, along with maybe Henry V or Coriolanus, that um, gets revived when people feel really uncomfortable about why they're at war. Um, oh, I, I, I thought I thought of that speech uh, 20 years ago. We, uh, the Amer I'm American, uh, the um, Iraq War. I thought, you know, here are all these reasons laid out in any war room. You know, any in intelligent people here are all the reasons not to go into Iraq, right? And this is why it's a very bad idea. And I think mm -hmm. Colin Powell, who recently has passed away, I think he said, you know, yeah. if you break it, you own it. And you know there were all these warnings out there, and they said, "Okay, fine, thank you, let's go." Yeah. You know, yeah. it it just what is that? You know, you could be very cynical and say is to you know pad the pockets of the right people uh, with uh, you know the the war machine that sort of thing. I don't. I think that may have been part of it, but then there was just this instinct that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's fascinating yeah. that um, you know something I, I I didn't expect when we started on on this project. Um, when we started off was the, the, the fact that um, Shakespeare provides, generally provides a language with which we can grapple or, or encourage um, uh, um, the, the, the wider community of um, producers, spectators, critics, um, just people who come across, you know, these uses of Shakespeare times of war to grapple with the complexity of the questions. Yeah. Um, so for us, it wasn't the fact that as some point in time Shakespeare was used for jingoistic purposes at other times he was used for pacifist purposes the the dominant um, narrative that has emerged from this project is that um, Shakespeare is um, yes used satirically yes used patriotically but mostly used very subtly um, to develop this sense of critical distance from what's happening that is so traumatic um, so frightening, um, so um, it really taps on, um, you know, all the, all the kind of uh, big ethical questions. And, and Shakespeare seems to be, um, to be used to um, help, uh, to help people grapple um, with, the, with, the, with those big questions. Yeah, well, I'm, I think this is great, and I, I love the I love hearing that there's going to there's going to be a curated display, uh, and I hope that things are such that when this happens, uh, I'll be able to, I'll be able to get over uh, and see it. Let's just hope yeah. for that, uh, yeah. and so forth. Well, you know, a large part of your career, and I'm moving down my list here, has to do with textual transmission and reception. Mm -hmm. And I am uh, very big on reception. I, I think it's uh, just a lot. And so 
uh, you really have focused on some, we're going from your public face, really, you know, with the accents and the warfare and the way that uh, outreach and the way to, to show people how this is pertinent, you know, this to our lives and so forth to an area that uh, only the <laughs> only the brave dare go and that is transmission <laughs> from manuscript into print and that that takes you into archives and into reading um, uh, old handwriting and that kind of thing you've worked a lot on book history and editing and textual transmission and you know there's no way I can ask, ask you to sum this up but could you try to uh, tell us Luckily, you know, some, of your, you know, some, some of what you found in, in doing this type of work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as with the other projects, my interest was sparked by a question that I found um, really interesting. And I think everybody can, can relate, really. Um, so the, um, the common understanding when I started working on the transmission of Shakespeare into print was that the first editor of Shakespeare. Um, Nicholas Rowe uh, published his edition of the works in 1709, and that's the beginning of the editorial tradition. Yeah. And um, I would like to mention someone else. Uh, I mentioned Julia earlier. I would like to mention someone else, um, Tom Berger. Everyone, M mention everyone. Really. Uh, yeah. Well, Tom, Big Tom um, um, had a very special role in my in my professional and personal life, um, he was initially uh, an informal tutor of mine. Um, and, and this is who? I'm sorry. This is who again? I I didn't hear. Thomas, Thomas Berger. Thomas um, Berger. Yes, of course. Yeah, yes. Thomas okay. L. Berger. Yes. Uh, and then we became colleagues and collaborators. Um, and and it was Tom. Um, when I um, I started getting really interested in print, um, I presented a paper at a conference in Liverpool. I was in my first year of my PhD program, and I had the cheek to stand up in front of this community of uh, very established textual scholars, um, and and um, express my opinion. <laughs> and disagree with some of the textual scholars who were sitting in that room. And um, Tom was intrigued. Um, he was a very smart, very funny man. And so he came up to me, was intrigued by this uh, kind of young, um, funny sounding Italian um, <laughs> woman who, um, you know, um, seemed to have uh, strong opinions um, in matters that, as you were saying earlier, are quite technical. And so Tom said to me, um, because it kind of related to the paper I presented in, it was 1993 um, in, in Liverpool. He said to me, um, that sounds all very interesting. Um, he said, why don't you go and find me an editor of Shakespeare before Nicholas Rowe? Because my paper was uh, about um, editorial intervention um, in an adapted text of, of King Lear. Um, that was uh, adapted and written by Nahum Tate and then published in 1681. So Tom was really intrigued by that paper and said, why don't you go and find me editors of Shakespeare before Nicholas Rowe? And I thought, of course, that's what I'm doing. That's the larger question. And I think that's the first job of a teacher. That's the first job of a tutor. You take someone's work because I was looking with um, blinkers, you know, at a very, very specific point. Um, I made a very specific argument and he helped me to develop it. And that's where my early work um, that then I published in the, uh, in the book called Shakespeare and the Rise of the Editor. Um, that's where my um, passion and my interest for the early transmission of Shakespeare's text came from. And I found indeed, of course, because nothing happens in a vacuum, um, I found that um, before editors became public figures, so before they put their names on the title page next to Shakespeare's name, they were already um, preparing the kind of copy for press. They were just preparing copy according to different methods and principles. Actually, we can't really speak about methods. Um, so nothing was done systematically to the text of the plays. Um, um, the, 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 the poems have a different kind of editorial traditions, but they were certainly um, preparing copy for press. And so I, I, by kind of spending an inordinate amount of time <laughs> 
in the British Library. Um, I was by then working in London, teaching in London. Um, I befriended so many uh, curators of the British Library. Some of them have become lifelong friends. Um, um, and uh, I, I looked at all the early editions and realized that there were patterns. So um, speech prefixes uh, got tweaked um, to announce the clarity for readers of the of the what used to be a, a kind of script meant for performance into a written text. Stage directions were added and changed, and occasionally um, also readings in the dialogue were amended. And so I came up with um, a different names for these um, correctors uh, of the press. I called them annotating readers. Um, because it's not fair to call them kind of editors because um, editors from 1709 onwards started to develop kind of more systematic and accountable methods. Um, but I, I had great fun and I really owe that, that excitement and those findings to Tom, who um, in a very, um, Tom I was North American and had an outrageous sense of humor. And I, I owe that, that part of my professional life and my research to Tom because he had the, the grace, it was not um, my, my official tutor, but he had the generosity and the inspiration to have a chat with me after that, that presentation at that conference. And then we were obviously stayed in touch um, after that. And I just followed up that question that he asked me yeah. Um, back in 1993. <laughs> well, I just, this just points to the importance of mentorship in the profession, not just ours, but anywhere. Uh, yeah. But in, in my experience too, uh, something can happen in a conversation that just mm -hmm. something can be said incidentally that you pick up on and there's an entire career. And yeah. what yeah. you, at the time that you saw that, this was unexplored terrain. Yeah. And yeah. so there you had it and you look and you go, I can do this for a long time and it, yeah. needs, it needs to be done. I have a reason to be in this, in this profession, right? Yeah, it took me 14 years. From 1993, I finished my PhD, which was on a slightly different topic. And then I picked up again and the, the, that, that uh, lead. Um, and uh, it, it, it took me, I mean, my, my book came out in 2007. So um, <laughs> it was, it it was right. a, long, a long time coming, but it was, it was fantastic. I basically um, uh, trained myself as a kind of uh, book historian, textual scholar in those days, back in those days, uh, with Tom kind of teasing me and uh, guiding me along the way. But as, as you said, um, Tom is the what it takes for I, th I think in any profession although obviously I only know my own profession but that's what it takes uh, for someone who's been in the profession for longer than a younger researcher to go to the younger researcher who's doing really interesting work already and just say look at the wider picture um, this is your direction of trouble and um, so that's why Tom was such an inspiration for me, um, both as an editor and as a textual scholar, but also as a, as a mentor. Uh, it, it was quite literally life changing. Um, meeting yeah. Tom back in 1993. <laughs> yeah, we're getting into a narrow area, even for Shakespeareans in some cases, but it's one that I love because when you talk to the older scholars, if they're nice people, uh, like Tom, uh, then all of them have had the experience that they are traveling down this road and they have to stay focused on the course they're on because mm -hmm. everyone's on, uh, it, there's a long arc to mm -hmm. from inception to publication. We are not like these folks in the sciences and my colleagues in social sciences who can sort of gun out from a laboratory research, all of these. It's a long arc. And along the way, they see many different things that they don't have time and they know they never will have time to, yeah. to examine. And yeah. then when that younger scholar, capable younger scholar comes along, they go, well, here you are. Yeah. You know, if you yeah. need a place, you know, it's just like right outside this little um, whiskey town in Oklahoma, there's an area over here that you yeah. really need to take a look at because it's important, but I don't have time for it. Isn't that something? 
And uh, it's a great, it's a, it's a sense of exploration. It really is, you know. Uh, and now that I'm, I'm um, older and I've edited for quite some time, um, I'm still editing, uh, I'm editing Richard III for Arden IV, but I'm also one of the two general editors of a new series, um, the Cambridge Shakespeare Editions, that has just been contracted by Cambridge and will produce another um, scholarly edition of Shakespeare, which we hope is going to be quite um, diverse and different Very good. Uh, while, while building on the, on the traditional scholarship. Yeah. And this is how I guess my the the, the two or, or three, as you said right at the beginning, um, kind of uh, areas of my research interest kind of link up and connect, because I um, I was lucky I I, I met Tom, um, but uh, I become aware of the fact that editing and textual studies is one of the least diversified um, um, subfields in Shakespeare studies in academia more generally. And so um, I am deeply invested as I was with the Shakespeare on, on uh, sorry, book in, in, on, on Shakespeare's accents. Um, I'm really invested uh, and so are my fellow general editors, uh, MJ Kidney and um, Gillian Woods. Um, we are incidentally the first all female team of general editors of Shakespeare because the field is or used to be predominantly uh, uh, white and male and um, scholars are affiliated with very select um, um, institutions, uh, academic institutions in the West. And even in this field, we are trying to um, instill an understanding of editing that, yes, it's technical, but it's also philosophical. It's part of the way you edit is informed by a practical method, which in turn is informed by ideas um, that have to do with who you believe um, you're editing. Um, so what do you think um, Shakespeare was? What kind of author Shakespeare was? Uh, man of letter, man of the theater, what it is that you're doing when you're editing, whose voice, whose authority you're trying to um, uh, establish. These are all questions that are really philosophically loaded and they are answered differently depending on who's editing. So um, for, um, for Shakespeare editing and textual studies to move into the 20th century, it's fundamental that we produce um, slightly, um, not slightly, um, significantly diverse editions um, so that they're, they're more appealing and accessible to a wider readership, but also prepared by more diverse scholars um, who may be put off from the idea that, as you were saying, uh, editing is perceived as kind of quite technical and quite arcane and, you know, that, that you might feel that you your editing is not for you unless you were trained and brought up by an established scholar. Now, I it was complete serendipity for me. Meeting Tom was chance, um, and I felt very lucky because he gave me the confidence to get started. But now that I've edited for years, again, I'm thinking, what can I do to encourage other people who may have been in my position or might be in my position now as in not even being um, English speakers, not being uh, white male and you know, trained at, uh, at a select um, university. All of that described, actually all of, all, all of those features describe me, um, but I had, I had that kind of lucky break. I, I, I met Tom, but not everybody can rely on meeting, no. you know, Tom. So what can we do um, as editors to invite other scholars um, that um, may not think of editing as something for them to edit? So that the oh, yes. So the, you see, this is this is uh, spot on here because uh, of course I'm in Japan, and so I'm in a non-native speaking environment. Mm -hmm. A lot of my a lot of my waking day and uh, the, uh, the, the ability of my students and my colleagues in the Shakespeare Society and so forth, uh, the, they, they may not feel comfortable um, doing a Lacanian reading of this or that. I don't feel in my native tongue. I, I just, it seems a little bit 
um, and just a little too obtuse, obtuse for me, but these are people who are extraordinarily drawn to detail and can do this kind of work that needs to be done. And that's Absolutely. not just in Japan, that's, that's globally. And people, yeah. and it's a perfect area for people who are uh, out of their, uh, in, in a non-native situation. Yeah. Yeah. where they they may not want to write the next great you know work of interpreting Shakespeare whatever that would be I don't know what that would be but this is the work that needs to be done and yeah. it, it needs to be done a lot more needs to be done and there are all kinds of people out there who can do it and do it well uh, Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. and if more diverse people get glo to global globally uh, across the world Absolutely. yes and if more, if more diverse scholars get to edit Shakespeare, we will all benefit from that because we will get different insights, a wider range of insights into what a particular line or speech might mean because people come from a different background, different linguistic and cultural contexts, and they will see different things in those lines. Yes. So it's about acknowledging, even in textual editing, uh, in, in editing textual studies, which is a quite traditionally conservative field, is the importance of acknowledging that there is nothing set in stone about Shakespeare's text. Shakespeare's text is extremely unstable. It's the product of editorial labor. And so it will read differently, not just the notes that explain what something means, but even the words themselves that will look quite differently if someone else comes along and has a different sensitivity yes. to the etymology of a word or the origin of a word. And so we all stand to gain a great deal because otherwise the kind of scholarly editions of Shakespeare tend to look pretty much all the same. <laughs> yes. With, um, what certainly with the Cambridge Shakespeare editions, what we're trying to do is to commission diversely uh, but also to, um, we have envision, envisioned um, uh, a series that will um, open up uh, the kind of uh, uh, knowledge that we've inherited about, um, about Shakespeare through the editorial apparatus. So we, we are trying to invite um, different scholars to edit from a different starting point, uh, constructing an apparatus around the text that will encourage um, those who pick up the editions and read them or want to maybe stage them in the theater, not to, not to take what they find in the book or the digital edition as uh, objective knowledge, but as an interpretation, uh, something that the editors produces. And we are encouraging and we will encourage editors to involve the reader uh, or the theater director to continue that work of interpretation so that um, it's, um, it's, it's more, editions will become more representative of kind of the global community that yes. works with Shakespeare and plays with Shakespeare. Because at the moment, we've got this paradox that only a very small number of scholars get to edit Shakespeare and the world reads Shakespeare. And you think, why should such a, a, a uniform um, select and limited number of people mediate Shakespeare for the rest of the world. Let's get the rest of the world to collaborate in this, in this process of remediation of Shakespeare's works, so that Shakespeare's works start breathing. You, you know, we breathe new life into them and they become more inspiring, accessible to, to, more, to more people. Um, trying to explode this sense that um, Shakespeare can only mean something and then you communicate what you think Shakespeare means to the rest of the world. No, Shakespeare only signifies um, within a community of readers and interpreters and the interpretation and the reading will change accordingly to who's doing the reading. So we need to, um, we need to um, make sure that we storm that castle. <laughs> well, I think that uh, the uh, castle will will want uh, to be stormed at some point because it, you need uh, person power. Um, you said person hours. There are a lot of hours that go into this, and particularly mm -hmm. if uh, we're in the digital age and have been for a long time, and there is uh, that to consider and be done. Also, I'm involved in a bit of that myself, mm -hmm. um, and um, over <laughs> too much over the past weekend, and it was tedious. You know, I'm thinking, oh, mm -hmm. if I if I just had 
uh, you know, we had stu we have students who work on it, but they were busy doing other things. Uh, I wanted to also emphasize your work. Uh, I spoke with uh, earlier with Heidi Craig, uh, oh, yeah. who's a uh, because we we're trying to get young young geese career, younger career scholars in this. And, and I was thinking about her when you were talking about younger scholars and she's uh, with the World Shakespeare Bibliography. And there is in development a digital paratext initiative that I think that you're very much involved with. And for people who may not know, when we say paratext, we mean those things, the embroidery, and let's not uh, use that, the embroidery, but also the way in which a text, a book, or any production is framed uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the, the graphics, the preface, the uh, uh, images that are included in it, uh, the, the things that we see in the first folio, how that introductory material, material frames, the order of the plays, every, all of this stuff, that, you know, the, the hermeneutics of interpretation that this editor that you've looked into uh, what they want to do. And the, the ability to just be able to search out heritage yeah. in rare books that we, we may not, you know, be within hand's reach, right? So tell us a little bit about that project. If you it, could. Uh, again, it's something um, professionally and personally so relevant um, for me and certainly my career trajectory. Tom and I edited um, an additional paratext for, for Cambridge University Press. Um, sadly, uh, Tom passed away shortly after that edition was published, um, and it was shortly after uh, Tom passed away that I met Heidi, who was working on paratext from the restoration period, taking on what uh, Tom had taught me and the work we'd done together. And then I had the chance to uh, meet Heidi, this brilliant uh, young scholar, and we not only um, decided to join forces so that we would have um, all the paratexts up to 1642, but now up to 1660, 1642 to 1660 is Heidi's um, area uh, of research interest. Um, but also we are currently um, uh, working on moving um, that um, uh, bank uh, of data from print to a database. And uh, I, um, I am so grateful um, to Heidi, um, not because she's expanding, not only because she's expanding the kind of the, the time range for, for that project, but also because she's um, in the driving seat as it comes to negotiating transmission from print to digital, which hands up, I, I, I'm, I'm at the receiving end. So I, I, I'm a user of databases. Um, the, the knowledge that goes into creating databases is quite extraordinary. That's something that I have not done personally. I'm just collaborating with Heidi. We are trying to um, work out together how best to present uh, all those texts that, yes, as you were saying, um, affect the reader's experience of some key canonical texts, including Shakespeare, but also other early modern dramatists. But how to do that? so that um, the, all that data is um, accessible and clear and reusable um, digitally. Um, and Heidi is really quite extraordinary. Uh, as yeah. you said, she's also in charge of the Shakespeare World Bibliography and the Early Modern Dramatic par Paratexts, um, uh, shortened as MDIP, is, is a resource that we, um, we launched earlier this year um, at the Shakespeare Association uh, of America conference mm -hmm. and was very warmly received. And um, we have uh, uh, plans to relaunch a slightly different version in April next year. Yeah. Uh, so for me, that's the future. For me, um, it, goes, it goes beyond me. It will go beyond my personal trajectory. Um, yeah, I did well, when I take on and move way, way beyond what, what I could reach myself personally. So that's very exciting for me. Sonia, you need, you need everybody in, you know, and, and I said this in a prior show, but I'll say it again because I kind of like it. It makes me feel smart. Uh, but uh, we, uh, my wife and I, we have, we spend a lot of time in Barcelona. She has family. We were both married before, but anyhow, we, I spent, uh, not lately, but, um, you know, and, 
in Barcelona, in Italy, in, in any of these places, uh, when you see the Sagrada Familia, you know, and you see the other older churches, the uh, Basilica of yeah. uh, Santa yeah. Maria de Mar, uh, and you look and you just wonder, it's just a wondrous achievement. You know, it's, it's some, a, a church that people have not heard of that much outside. And you wander around and you go up to Monject in, in Barcelona and you see this big cruise ship going in. It just sort of entered my uh, uh, country boy mind. I'm going, who who builds these things <laughs> you know these ships these cathedrals and i you know how do they how do you do this and it just hit me then it said a lot of people a yeah. lot of people yeah. build these yeah. things you yeah. know yeah. and you need everybody right yeah. so the guy who knows how to do plumbing doesn't know a thing about you know how to lay carpet or to do tile <laughs> floors or or to build walls and you know that you have to have everybody uh, yeah. And people develop their own specialties. So I, that's what I love about the project that you're doing uh, mm -hmm. that in, a, uh, in affiliation with the Folger. I like to shout out to the Folger whenever I can. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and Heidi's involvement with that, uh, taking on that uh, enormous task, task with the uh, bibliography and so forth. Uh, and also, I wanted to say that I, I found years ago, I was in bibliography, but I would go to these big conferences, and I'd see these papers, and it was in the middle of this critical theory thing, and I, I don't uh, poo-poo critical theory, I mean, uh, Foucault meant a lot to me when I was coming up, and, and a, a number of these, these theorists now who are sort of um, maligned, uh, you know, particularly in more conservative circles, but mm -hmm. Uh, they opened up the world and so forth, but I would go to these conferences and I did not want to hear another paper that I really couldn't understand, you know, yeah. that, that was written for a reader who would have to really spend a lot of time for it. And I would always go to the bibliography or textual studies, and there'd be three people in there and there'd be three people reading. <laughs> and, and almost invariably, two of the three papers were fabulous, just fabulously exciting, you know, and uh, uh, so yes, the, uh, there's something really um, satisfying about working with words. So uh, obviously critical theory uh, works with big ideas and has a huge impact on how we read texts. So yeah. as you said, you know, uh, not to absolutely not to knock it at all. But there's something really immediate and satisfying about working with words and is uh, uh, um, printed words or manuscript words. So you're actually looking at objects. So what you're looking at is a material history. And then of course, you're, the way you're reading those objects is informed by the same big ideas that the critical theorists use in their field. But in, 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 in the field of, of textual studies and book history, those ideas are applied to object. So it's yeah. an object, so it's quite satisfying. Yeah. For example, when you look at uh, paratexts, all these texts that introduce um, um, a play or maybe come after the play, and you look at them, how um, materially they, they affect your experience of that text. Uh, one of my uh, favorite examples is uh, to go back to Trollis and Cressida, the fact that there are two issues, both published in 1609, one that refers to the play as a play, the other one seems to shy away from the commercial stage and um, uh, uh, draws the reader's attention to its classical heritage. Yeah. So like Shakespeare, like a modern classic. So yeah. one going yeah. for the commercial appeal, the theatrical appeal, one going for it. this. This is a play, it looks like a play, but it's not a play. It's, it's a, a literary yeah. text. It's a, a kind of, you know, classical text. And it's fabulous because you're not just um, speculating about how you might want to read Troilus and Cressida, which is totally uh, uh, legitimate, but you're, you're grounding your reading of Troilus and Cressida in material features of the early editions. And so you, of course, you still speculate, but you speculate on the basis of evidence that can tell us stories about how Troilus and Cressida was read by others. So I am also personally very, very excited by the idea that we can um, listen to early generations and understand how maybe they understood Shakespeare. So I'm, I'm very much um, historicist in my approach to Shakespeare, even when it comes to the present. You know, I, I want to see the present as part of a longer paradigm. So yeah, hooray for textual studies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I had one little story where I, it doesn't have to do with Shakespeare. It was a, a, a paper on uh, Ray Bradbury, the uh, science fiction writer who was very pop popular in his time and it still is. And uh, 
uh, this guy had done research on Ray Bradbury and he wrote the famous book, The Martian Chronicles. And they were really just a series of chapters and he could do short stories, but he couldn't do novels. So he goes to New York and he doesn't have that much money. So he stays in the YMCA and he goes and talks to the publisher. And he said, listen, if you can arrange chapters in a way that makes this seem like a novel, we'll publish it as a novel. And then uh, the, the speaker, and I forgot his name, uh, came back. He said he went back to the YMCA and he made a, a list of chapters that is that are not that's not followed in succeeding editions, uh, right? He said, and I know he made this list of chapters in the YMCA at that time, you know, what is 1957, whenever. And he said, because here's the paper. <laughs> he had the paper that Bradbury wrote, you know, and those so those sorts of, of things. Chapters, the list of chapters built the novel. If yes. the, so uh, if you want to argue the, how to arrange chapters, this is what he said yeah. at first. It might not be the best way, but so that's, that's the how, paratext. The paratext yeah. constructing the text. That's it. Fabulous. That's it. What it's fabulous. It's, it's just the kind of revelation that you yeah. have in the British Library frequently. You know where yeah. you can see this, uh, and it puts you. You you at one point. Now this might sound a little flaky, but you can feel those people, and. Mm. And what they were doing, you know, even but down to, to the to transfer your story um, to to a Shakespearean context, you could say that Shakespeare was put together as a yes. as a literary author yes. by yes. the people who published him, both as individual plays with their individual paratext, but of course in 1623 yes. when Hemingway and Condo uh, commissioned the the stationers to produce something as monumental as the first folio. You could say that Shakespeare had the short stories, but the people who created the novel were not Shakespeare. And they, they weaved the plays together. For example, the history plays are not as like such a kind of uh, clear sequence as they appear to be in the folio because they have different titles that were written at different times, not as a sequence. And they are rearranged into a sequence in the folio so that the history plays look like a cycle, but they were not written as a cycle no, no. in fact reverse they were in reverse order it's incredible yeah. yeah the second trilogy what we call this that it was actually written first so yeah. the Henry the sixes and richard the third were written first and yeah. then came richard the second and the fourth and then the fifth so it's it's fantastic your stories yeah. applies to shakespeare completely <laughs> yeah yeah well uh, I, I don't want to miss uh, your work, and it's fairly recent, and we can't, and it's, I want to make sure I pronounce this uh, correctly, Ivo Van Hove, is that right, oh, Ivo Van, Van yeah. Hove? Ivo Van Hove, for those who are, might not be familiar, it's very well known within the circles of the avant-garde theater, but I mean, yeah. he's a pioneer, he has done things off-Broadway and taking the, the, these chances, you know, where things, you know, sometimes off-Broadway is where things just go to die and people get disappointed and they get frustrated and they, they're still working their day jobs or they're as waiters and so forth and, and things are, are not, but he, he just keeps plowing through and getting it and here and there, these things click and he gets on and he was one of the final people who kind of, he, his work is sort of, among others, is sort of a eulogy to David Bowie's uh, life and career, uh, isn't it? You know, because he was one of, there at the finale. Um, yeah. Uh, and so you have written a book and he has contributed to the book uh, and explain some of that to us because I'm going to say something wrong pretty soon here. This is... That, that, that was another, um, that was another magical uh, moment. Um, I uh, got to talk to um, Ivo after a platform at the Barbican, after his premiere of Roman Tragedies, because I was editing Tis Pity, um, she's a horror, and I knew that he had directed Tis Pity, and so I just asked him if um, I could access the archives, that I could find photo, photo uh, production photos from, from the, all the production, and then of course we talked about Roman Tragedies. And so I, I, I got to know him, and his uh, partner, uh, Jan Fisbegold, uh, who uh, designs um, what they together call their alternative realities. And that's how you experience Ivo and Jan's work. It's so emotional, intellectually stimulating, but also emotional because you quite literally, they have the power together 
to create these alternative realities where theater suddenly really matters. So I think the secret of evil success is that people might think of evil as experimental and therefore, as you said, you know, quite obscure and out there and not for me. Evil wants to reach people. He says that he, um, yes, he and has and has reached very, yes. very many. So the, the musical, absolutely, the, the homage uh, to, the, to uh, Bowie. Lazarus, uh, Lazarus uh, I yeah. guess, we, yeah. Yeah. The final, yeah. Um, so he's, he's experimental, but he's not uh, elitist in his work. He's the opposite. He wants to take his work to as many people as possible. Um, and he does that because of the, the, the power that he infuses, the creative power in, that he infuses in all of his work. He's a really exciting director to watch. And Jan is an amazing designer. Um, you never forget Evo's productions. You come out of the theater a different person. I am not exaggerating. The, after watching Roman tragedies, which is six hours long without an interval, so you, you're kind of allowed, you're allowed. There are moments when um, you could call them brief intermissions, but they're so brief that you're bound to kind of miss some of, 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 of that show. And Evo wanted to induce that sense of everything happening all the time and that you can't keep up with what's happening because Roman tragedy is um, an adaptation of Coriolanus, uh, Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra. He, it's, it's, meant to, um, um, it's meant to conjure the experience of uh, kind of politics in the 21st century, world events and how we feel because of uh, digital media and social media that we feel connected all the time, that we should know everything immediately and actually we are maybe more disempowered than, than we were um, before the advent of social media. So it was mind blowing, mind blowing. I, I didn't take that, I didn't expect that. I went to see what I thought was a modern dress adaptation of the Roman tragedies and I came uh -huh. out. And I struggled to find my way home. Literally, I, I, I nearly went the wrong way on the tube because my mind was on fire because it made me think about the way in which I access information, what I do with that information. If that empowers me as a citizen of a kind of seemingly democratic um, um, country, uh, and, and I mean, that doesn't, I don't mean the UK or Italy, it's uh, the, the alternative reality applied to all kind of uh, postmodern, um, uh, a kind of uh, um, first world um, countries where um, people have the privilege of, of being able to access information in, in mm. real time. Of course, that mm. doesn't apply worldwide. Um, but um, so evil um, has, um, I think, um, uh, one of the most kind of powerful um, connection with um, the world, not just of, of the work of Shakespeare, but the, the classics in general, he seemed to be able to uh, reimagine the classics as burningly contemporary. Uh, and it's, that is not in a reductive way, if you know what I mean. Um, so um, the, the, that encounter was absolutely fateful. And I'm going to mention someone else um, without whom that book would not have been possible. Um, Susan Bennett, yes. um, theater studies and, and a professor in Shakespearean, um, wonderful, another wonderful um, colleague collaborator. And um, it was Susan who, um, I, I was writing about evil here and there. And it was Susan who said, um, we, need, we need a book on evil. It, it, it is, he is becoming so prominent. And um, so again, you know, I, um, I was very lucky. I was talking to this wonderful colleague of mine who said, let's talk to Ivo. And so I emailed Ivo and I said, um, having finished my work on TSPT, how about we come and talk to you in Amsterdam about a project that focuses on your work. And, and Ivo in um, kind of, uh, half jokingly, half seriously said, uh, it's about time that you <laughs> guys wrote a book about my work. <laughs> yeah, so you it, so, it merged at the right time. Well, yeah. what I'm gathering about this, uh, along with the uh, the fact that I really, really want to see 
uh, I've never seen a production, a Van Hove production. I would really, I, I'm very much uh, addicted when I'm in London, even from being very young, uh, to the any theater. And if it's uh, off West End, whatever, a little kind of burnt out place on Tottenham Court Road, where I remember there was a little theater uh, that did Beckett uh, uh, that I will never forget. Um, this, uh, you know, and we've been in a period of time where I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, his, the, the, you know, we will survive this and be able to go back to the theater and have that experience. Uh, but uh, very importantly, and we have set up a theme uh, that I didn't have in the uh, agenda about uh, generational production of this and, <clears throat> and helping others along and collaborating and so forth. And you talked about just walking up and asking. Right. And so yeah. you, I yes. contacted you out of the blue. We've never, we haven't met at conferences. Yes. And so <clears throat> anytime I, <clears throat> anytime I, I do that, I'm expecting a, a scholar to say, Tom, listen, you, I'm just busy. <laughs> I, don't, uh -huh. I don't know what you're doing this little podcast over in Tokyo and uh, you know, the good knock yourself out and, and maybe later. And you know, I, nobody does. People just it's say, yes. you just uh, need to ask, you just ask, yeah. you just walk up and yeah. ask. And I've always yeah. done that. Now, not always have I been received well, but I've always said, uh -huh. if, if you don't ask, you will not receive. Absolutely. It's not exactly. Um, yep. and, and I'm so glad I, 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 I met, ask, I asked Ivo, I met him, I asked him, and then uh, wonderful things um, came out of, of, of that fateful encounter. Um, before we move away from from that, I, I wanted to say, since you mentioned the fact that you you'd like to to watch Evo in action, that you can. One of the um, kind of good things to come out of the absolute devastation that has been COVID is the fact that um, uh, Evo has predictably led the way in organizing live streaming of his productions. So they broadcast as they happen in Amsterdam. If you look up um, International um, Turner Group Amsterdam, ITA, mm -hmm. ita.nl for Netherlands, you can reserve a ticket um, yes. and then log on. And it's of course not the same as being in the theater, but something else I've become very passionate about during the lockdown is the fact that um, Shakespeare has become networked and it's actually opened up access. Yeah. So I couldn't go to Amsterdam this Sunday, but I'll be tuning in and I'll be watching it from, from London if I'm back in London by Sunday. Yeah. Ivo is also a visionary when it comes to, um, again, reaching people, reaching out to people, even at times when um, it's been challenging for people to go to theaters. And uh, he has uh, encouraged other world directors to do the same. Um, I listened to him to a round table um, that he participated in during the second lockdown or the first lockdown, um, uh, hosted by the, the Festival Theatre in Tokyo. Um, I, I can share uh, the link with that, I think it's still online, where um, he was um, saying to the other directors, the financial model is very simple. Um, you only need um, a TV crew in the theater mm -hmm. to work with your actors in the morning. They will film the production live for you and you can then broadcast it. And if you do that and you sell the tickets online, which are cheaper than the tickets you sell for a live performance, we may be half of the people in the theater or no people at all at the beginning, yet no one in the theater. He can still, he said, you can either break even or actually make a profit. So I really like that about about Ivo because he's he's a, a visionary, um, but he's also really uh, practical, and his aim has always been to to reach out to people. Um, so um, yeah, by all means, um, to go back to your point, ask ask approach <laughs> anybody anyone <laughs> and we'll get uh, we'll get all of this uh, we'll get this information up on screen uh we Great. we Great. Uh, uh do this as a podcast also but uh we'll uh, make sure the information is available widely Brilliant. available Brilliant. for uh my uh, my people over here but it turns out that it's not over here as much as uh it's part of the world you know anything that you put out there uh i did want to 
uh, talk with you, sort of, sort of not in closing quite yet, but I did want to talk with you about Tis Pity. I have a student who uh, came, what she, two years ago, she came in and said, uh, and, you know, polite uh, young woman who said, uh, I, uh, you're the Shakespeare guy here, and I want to work on Tis Pity, she's a whore. And I said, well, uh, oh, <laughs> okay, but uh, <laughs> Um, I, I'm, you know, my Ford is a little rusty, uh, if there was ever, you know, anything, but uh, I'm pretty good Webster and, you know, you know, we have our people and I, and I'm thinking, uh, okay, she, I, what do you want to look at? She said, I'd like to look at marriage. I would like to look at law. And so I had to get an education from uh, uh, Sonia Masai first, your edition of Tispity, and also uh, look into uh, marital law in England and also into uh, incest. And mm -hmm. so I always, I, I'm, you know, completely red faced when I'm having to tutor uh, her and also other graduate students because, you know, I said, okay, well, incest, um, incest is a big deal. It's a big deal. And now this is, this is incest, incest, you know, whereas, you know, Henry VIII and that uh, whole business of whether or not uh, his wife actually slept with her, his brother or whatever, it consummated the marriage. Uh, but uh, it's been just wonderful, actually. It's just opened up all of this. Uh, and thank you for that addition. I don't think that was the first thing people were running for uh, when you started. You must have started much earlier. I think, it, did it come out uh, about 10 years ago? Is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah. 2011, I think. Yeah. And so you yeah. started far sooner than that. And mm -hmm. uh, so it might have not been the, 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 the most attractive play to go. For. But were, did, did, did you not feel the same way? You know, and I, I felt like he was. Uh, yes. No, I, I also um, didn't expect to um, empathize quite so much with Annabella and Giovanni, the brother and sister who um, have the incestuous affair in the play. Um, it was only when I started working on it and I was commissioned to edit it. I didn't have a choice. Uh, oh, really? Said, oh, it was, it like was you, sort of funny. Like to edit this pity. And I, um, I, I, um, I think um, the, it, it, it was, it was a very, um, it was a very interesting choice. Um, the series editors, uh, John Jowett, Susan Gossett, and Gordon McMullen, another shout out. Yeah, yeah. Um, they knew my work as an editor and they knew that um, my, again, again, my background, um, the, the setting of this PT had never been looked at seriously. And I, um, coming from um, uh, uh, um, a training um, in, in, in Italy, it's very strong um, kind of background in, in um, the humanities and uh, the kind of Renaissance humanism and civic humanism that Ford is steeped into, I recognized um, some features of the play that other editors had not noticed really spoke to me. And what I found, uh, which made the play so interesting to me, and I think, I hope I did the play justice because I don't think John Ford wanted to write something that people would be horrified by. I think he wanted to play something that would really shock them into thinking differently about marriage, about politics. Mm -hmm. So what he did, he, um, by setting, I think by setting um, that play in Parma, um, evoked um, an ideal of self-governance. So an idea of incest, not as a moral sin, but as a political statement. So Giovanni is initially likable because he wants to assert his own right to, to, to keep himself to himself and Annabella to himself because they are surrounded by pretty unlikely characters. And Parma is surrounded by pretty dangerous powers, secular and spiritual, emperors and popes. And Parma is Giovanni and Annabella, is a mercantile city-state. And the idea of civic humanism was for the city-states, like the Renaissance man that Giovanni is, to retain their autonomy. It was a mar marvelous ideal. It makes me cry, you know, the perfection of Parma. Parma means shield. Um, and he had the round structure of a Roman shield, and he had the perfection 
of uh, a geometrical um, ideal because it's just perpendicular in intersecting roads. Everything was planned to reflect um, this kind of ideal state of reason and balance and autonomy. So the trick Ford makes you care so much about Giovanni and Annabella because they are wonderful. They are idealists. They're basically Romeo and Juliet. They're Romeo and, and Juliet. Comes from Romeo and Juliet. And yeah. it's so outrageous because you are made to uh, cheer them on. And then you think they're brother and sister. <laughs> and, but and, that's the yeah. trick. That's tragedy, right? Yeah. And so Ford was giving the British, the English, um, a prime example of classical tragedy, of incest tragedy, a la Oedipus Rex, uh, you know, what Sophocles has done for the Greeks. Yeah. He wanted to do it with the, for the English. And, and so I found a lot of beauty in it. I, I wasn't horrified at all. And I then started to teach it to my own students who will come to class, you know, just wanting to hide <laughs> behind their books because they didn't want to hear someone talk about sibling incest. And they would leave the classroom feeling inspired. And also um, really, I think, um, challenged by the thought that incest, like any other type of sexual desire, is cultural. So we cringe, but the cringing is more cultural than natural. Um, and, and so I, um, I, I, I just came to love this pity. Um, I, have, uh, I have to, and uh, we're working a little bit on law. We're, we're trying to anchor things in law because uh, of course, it, I, I, I feel certain that if you were John, John Ford, you had to be, feel the shadow of Shakespeare, the shadow of John, of all of those who preceded you. And you do have to do something new. Your, your challenge is a <laughs> sort of Harold Bloom sort of thing. You know, the anxiety of influence you have to I overcome. But <laughs> I don't think it was quite that. It's just, you know, I can't put on Romeo and Juliet again. Right? Yeah. We've, we've done plenty of that by now. So yeah. we've got to look into it. And Romeo and Juliet are questionable. They didn't have witnesses at their marriage. It's questionable whether or not they uh, were really and they consummated in the, you know, the whole thing. So, you know, you could say there, Young there's rebels. a violation of church law, right? Yeah. And we've yes. looked into this. Uh, there is no question that uh, <laughs> Ferdinand and Annabella, no question. <laughs> No, that they were breaking they're, the they're rules. They're breaking the law. <laughs> and they're not only breaking the law in the sense that, you know, we would be more tolerant about a uh, disobedient daughter uh, running off into the woods and maybe, mm -hmm. you know, uh, having premarital sex if they ma managed to get the ceremony in there before uh, any yeah. babies came along or whatnot. That would be okay. Yeah. But uh, in this case, there's no way out. The, you no. no way. And yeah. now also now and then, you know, we could be yeah. more tolerant uh, with, of course, we've had, you know, uh, of course, the women's movement and so forth. But we don't do that either. You know, we are actually now less tolerant. Um, I think so. something, something, you know, talk about discoveries and the excitement of research. Again, something I did not know before I started working on that edition is that um, we have become very liberated, as you say, after the 60s and 70s in terms of um, um, uh, sexuality agency for, for women and then diverse sexualities. But we've become, if anything, more entrenched in our sense that incest is unnatural. I'm, 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 not, I'm not questioning the, the, the fact that uh, um, the um, uh, incest breaks some um, pretty um, uh, bi biological also uh, laws in some in some cases, in some configurations, though not others. Um, I, I, I read an article in The Lancet um, that, that established pretty, um, pretty firmly, objectively, that in some communities, um, incest, um, not, not sibling, but cousin, um, is a, a practice that's, that uh, actually, um, uh, it, it, it increases the number of uh, infant mortality, um, but increases fertility in communities where uh, they need a lot of children because maybe they are farming communities. And so the law there, the law there is different. And so that perception of what constitutes incest is different from our sense of what constitutes incest. And what I found out is that we have a much stronger reaction that seems to be 
completely instinctive, whereas I'm saying is cultural, than the early moderns did. Because according to the early moderns, sexuality was a manifestation of the fall. So even kind of canonical heterosexual desire um, embedded in marriage um, was seen as a necessary evil, um, uh, only justified by the need of, for, for reproduction and transmission of goods and family patrimony. So everything that was sexual, from heterosexuality to um, heterosexuality without parental consent, so outside marriage, to homosocial, homoerotic, homosexual desire, to incest, were seen as part of one, one manifestation of our uh, fallen nature as mankind. So paradoxically, incest wasn't seen as um, more repugnant or more evil. It was, it was yes, more, more um, um, sinful than, say, uh, sex outside marriage, outside wedlock. But it was, a, it, it, was a, it was a matter of degree rather than quality. Whereas, oh. because for us, some sexualities have become accepted and legalized, we have a much stronger reaction to incest. Yeah. Than, than in the other modern period. It would be punished, it would be seen as illegal, yeah. but it was part and parcel of human sexuality in a way that it's not for us. Yeah. And, and that to me was quite shocking. I, yeah. um, I didn't and it probably would have involved younger, very, uh, kids who are, we would deem to be too young to be involved in that type of activity anyway. Uh, and church, church law, I, I think they may have been aware of the fact that if you're going to hold to this Adam and Eve business as the uh, earthly father and mother, and you're going to hold to that, then you mm -hmm. cannot have a situation there where we do not come from incestuous relationships, if yeah. there are only two. Of course, Cain somewhere, Cain seems to find some people outside. So it's a little bit vague there, but... Uh, <laughs> Very interesting when it comes to the Bible and, and how the Bible defines incest because uh, it's defined differently in different books. Yeah. So you you not, <laughs> not very you clear. Know. Yeah. What, what what is incest and what isn't then? Uh, in one uh, in one um, book of the Bible, um, adultery is classified as incest. Mm -hmm. You think? <laughs> mm -hmm. Come again, and yeah. that's because. Um, the, the community that that book we think was written for was nomadic. Yeah. And so they had to uh, police the boundaries, um, not only between blood relations or acquired, you know, in-laws, but also about people who quite li literally slept, you know, in tents next to each other. And they had to regulate. And, how and who were related, uh, very likely related. Totally, they were probably likely related, but the relation was seems to be less important than the physical proximity. Uh -huh. So the physical proximity constituted incest. Uh, <laughs> so it's really, really, really eye opening. And you think it has to do with space, less with biology or religion is to do with space, how you manage space. So sexual relations to manage resources and access to space. It's yeah. fascinating it is fascinating and ford's fascinating too just saying i'm going to give this play this title which had which yeah. had to uh it had to attract attention raise eyebrows uh yeah. you know, let's just start out you know this is going to be should seen, you, know. you should have seen the eyebrows on the tube uh the london underground while i was working on this project and i had you know 20 20 editions 20 different editions of this pity with the title printed on the cover and people would just you know just stop and, and, and it was a intake of breath and, and kind of yeah um very very twitchy twitching eyebrows <laughs> <laughs> oh that's just wonderful. Have actually a wonderful story at home about the title um i wanted an original map of parma to show that wonderful circular um architecture um um, design for that for that city state and the the best map is in the Vatican museums so I called the Vatican museums because I wanted to ask for permission to reproduce one of the maps that they have there and when I said what I was working on <laughs> the person in the Vatican museum just repeated the title out loud in Italian and they went peccato fosse cosa she was what? 
And it kind of echoed because there must have been a big room. And thankfully they said that because the, I think they were just about to slam the phone down. But because they started to say that title out loud, thankfully there was an English graduate from La Sapienza in Rome at the other side of the desk and said, I know, I know what that's about. It's okay. It's not, it's not, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not soft porn. It's, it's a canonical play by uh, a canonical English playwright. And that, that did the trick, but the title was going to um, make my life um, very hard. If it yes. wasn't for the fact that someone yes. recognized it. <laughs> Keep you from gaining entree there, right? Uh, uh, Tis pity. Well, uh, uh, that's that's great, and I think that we have gotten through the agenda here. And I, I just and there are so many other things I, I would love to to talk about. I would love to talk about the uh, uh, you know experience that you had uh, uh, going uh, from Italy to, and you know you you can't you you say yes you're you're Italian, but in Italy it matters so much where you're from. And I'm not saying it matters more than being from Liverpool or being from London or what, you know, it might be the, but, uh, but the history of Italy, of course, it has the, you know, the, when you go to a separate region, separate state, you get into separate uh, uh, feelings of identity that are very, very strong. I'd love to explore that, but that would take us a lot longer than uh, probably time that you have today. Um, what I would like to do is ask you to stay a little bit afterwards to debrief just a moment, if I, yes. if I may. Yes. Uh, and we're going to uh, uh, stop recording now, but not before I thank you on behalf of my university. I, you know, I'm a Gakuin University in Tokyo and the, uh, the JSPS, the, fund, the people who fund this, uh, who have been uh, very, very helpful. Uh, and the staff at my university to help do, do this. I wanted to have a symposium, and of course, you know, uh, we couldn't do that. Uh, and also to my friends in the Shakespeare Society of Japan, who uh, will be very, very interested in hearing from you and, and being mm -hmm. able to meet you it, it virtually as a person, see you as a person, and not as just a name on a text. And, it, and yeah. It, my my heartfelt thanks for having me on this. It's it's a, it's a lovely lovely initiative. Um, I feel privileged to be on on this. So thank you. Well, it was a privilege for us to have you, and the pleasure is all ours, Sonia. Thank you so much. Thank you.